Hey, we are live. Hope if you're a fan of the show, you like the new intro that was created by Mr. Foster right next to me. So that was pretty sweet. On this episode, we are going to be talking about why rice sucks. We're going to talk about KubeCon picks. We're going to be, have a few big spenders. And we have a very special guest that is none other than Liz Rice, not connected to the previous sucks comment at all. Welcome once again. Yeah, like Steve said, thanks for joining. We have a packed show ahead of you. So if you're on Twitch and you're live, you know, like, subscribe, follow the channel. We come live pretty much every week. We had a new time this week, an hour early, mm -hmm. but normally it's at uh, 12 p.m. Eastern, 5 GMT, and 9 a.m. if you're on the Pacific Coast. And if you're on YouTube, you know, like, subscribe, leave a comment, help us out. All right. And cool, cool. finally, the disclaimer. We didn't. I, I I blew through the intro. I was so excited. I didn't. We didn't actually introduce ourselves. Yeah. Well, I'm I'm Steve Jaguar. I'm I'm Mike Foster. Hey. And just in case, where's the disclaimer? The thoughts expressed on the show belong to the presenters only, and not any employer or sponsor. Yeah, that's needed. Especially with yeah. the first segment that's coming up. <laughs> All right, let's hit it. And this is, I just added this. So there's a reason why. This is the rice sucks section. And the re and it's a, this is a personal experience and minor complaint because I am an idiot. I was rearranging my office just before the show and I dumped uh, this now very paltry amount of water onto my laptop so this is now i had to scramble to get a different laptop to do the show uh but in my scramblings i thought i had to get the other laptop somewhere to recover it and then i found out that the old thing about sticking your phone into like rice which everybody kind of has in their house uh isn't actually good it turns out it turns out here's the leaderboard forget the sponge silica gel which everybody has bucket loads of sitting around in their house is number one. Cat litter was number two. That's what I liked. So if you've got cat litter just kicking around, cool. Just kick your cat out and shove your laptop into that filthy box and that hopefully will make it recover. Otherwise, instant couscous, rice and oatmeal, then rice. So right now, thankfully, believe it or not, I did have a paint bucket full of silica gel and my laptops in it. I've recovered super fast, but that's good. Everyone has, everyone destroys technology with water eventually. Oh yeah, been there. Sometimes wine, that happens. Mm -hmm. Happens to the best of us. And, <laughs> and, and the worst of us. Yeah. All right, so All right. this one What's snuck, you, you added this, this one uh, snuck past us on April Fool's, but we wanted to call some attention to it. Stack Overflow had a, a good joke that we wanted to touch on. And also a uh, kind of scary note, uh, yeah, where's the part two to this that was released? So this was 
the day before April Fools. So you saw it in April Fools. This was on the nineteenth, making reference to the key. Where's the stats? Here we go. So Stack Overflow, uh, a Stack Overflow question. Uh, somebody copies it within five minutes of hitting the page on average, and it adds up to forty million copies across seven point three million posts. And that was between March twenty sixth and April 9th this year. That's not much. That's a very short time span. So the, the, <laughs> it makes it really. We've always been talking about oh, copy from Stack Overflow and, as in the security industry and saying this is uh, this is oh, we're just going to cut it. But wow, like that's the first time I've seen a real stat. I mm -hmm. guess that's why they did the joke. They knew the stat, and uh, then they sort of released it here. That's insane and well concerning but mm -hmm. somehow relieving excellent yeah. shall we move swiftly forward because this uh, the banter bit of this show is going to be shorter than normal because we've left lots of space for no pressure when you get here liz to to chat uh the next one is yours yeah so i came across this uh this github uh, account shout out um to I'm not exactly sure the person who created this there. Uh, and it was interesting. He's showing uh, how he protects his cube configuration. And when I read this, it seemed like, so uh, EN CFS is uh, an encryption file system. Basically, he has the configuration. He mounts it. In, it's, it's encrypted by default. He mounts it into his user space, uses a password so that he has access. And then after a certain amount of time, the uh, access gets revoked. And yeah, I, there it is. Idle 15 minutes. If you're not accessing the drive, then it will unmount. So interesting way to go about it. I thought it would spark the conversation of how do people at work protect these configuration files? Because RBAC is great and all, but if you're keeping the same certificate for years and you know, leaving your well, computer open doesn't, run, doesn't really matter, right? Yeah, totally. Social engineering being what it is, being kind of the first line of attack for a lot of a lot of uh, you know the baddies. Mm -hmm. If the the, the dot cube directory has got a lot of power, and this is the, I don't know this might be the first time okay. I've seen anybody just talk about how to protect what's in there, you know, and the the credentials for. Well, I mean, if you are an admin, you've got keys to the kingdom there, right? That's uh, and I mean that's really it too, because you might have a developer that has specific file permissions for a namespace or something like that, but your operators. Your DevOps mm -hmm. engineers, they're going to have massive cube config files with probably multiple contexts and multiple different permissions they're moving through. So it becomes pretty uh, pretty intense and protection for those. <laughs> those are pretty important. So so we, we talked a little bit about this beforehand. Is this overkill? Like it's a good method, but would you use it? Yeah, and that's kind of the thing. Is, <laughs> I, I, I think... The, Part of it is you deter, you create security by deterring a lot of people because they're going to go for the path of least resistance too, right? So, but you also need to walk the line of, am I just creating more work for myself when nobody's really accessing this? So eh. mm. if it works, it works. Once you get into the flow of things, I'm sure it's not that bad. If you're only accessing cube config, you know, once or twice a day, and this is what you're doing, you know, checks out. But then yeah. imagine you have to put out fires and it's like three in the morning and you're constantly needing to go back and forth between cube controls. Not recommended, by the way, but you're doing it. You know, mm -hmm. you're really going to hate that you set this up a month later. <laughs> <laughs> it is. Well, people, and, and I guess the constant struggle with security is putting barriers in front of getting things done. And to do it to yourself, um, it conflicts with the fact that you sort of inherently always trust yourself, even though you don't trust anybody else, right? So you mm -hmm. might... This is a guy here who clearly, I don't know, I guess uh, drunk dials his ex-girlfriends all the time and has no faith in his own ability to keep security. So <laughs> oh, who knows? Sorry if uh, you're watching this at it's any a, point in time. It's a, it's a cool project and it's definitely worth uh, calling it out because I, I do know a lot of companies that don't even rotate certificates and things like no. that. So, you know, getting on a cadence for, hey, every six months, we're just going to update, make sure everybody has new certs and go through that process. Yeah. Useful. Yeah, it's good. It is good. It's a good conversation that we're having. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, so that's that's the early stuff because we're keeping it quick again. Now we're moving on to... Oh, no, you wanted to call out some CFPs. Yeah, just a quick CFP call out. Uh, the KubeCon North America 
ends on May 23rd for the CFP. So get your CFPs in for that. And the uh, Linux Foundation, the Open Source Summit, it's June 13th. So that's in Seattle. They've actually moved it. It's going to be a live event this year, if you're interested. That's pretty cool. Yeah, so it's awesome. All right. All right. I can see that Liz has arrived in the green room, so we can get through the uh, the last few items in the next four minutes. Um, all right. Let's do the next section. Here we go. All right. This one crossed my path, and I had to laugh. Google Argentina's domain name bought by a guy for two pounds, which was cool. Uh, Google doesn't seem to know how it happened. Here's the happy individual who's now semi-famous who managed to <laughs> buy google.com.ar, which I guess is what you use if you're in Argentina. Uh, and he just, if you're just reading through the story quickly, basically he just saw it, it didn't work, check, just checked it, and it was available. And for a joke, he thought, well, I'll just try and buy it. Mm -hmm. And he was able to buy it. And so he, he and then immediately got terrified that something bad was going to happen to him because he now owned one of Google's kind of like intellectual property sort of feels that way, you know? So he freaked out. <laughs> he kind of freaked out a little bit. Uh, and then, you know, got his 15 seconds of fame, I guess, or 15 minutes, thanks to this show as well. He's getting there. I just thought it was funny. It's in the W2F category big time because that's that's kind of weird, isn't it? That Yeah, I was shocked so how that happened. It was Google went down and then all of a sudden the registry allowed the domain to be bought to be bought, like the the Argentinian yeah. public service, I guess. Yeah. That's yeah. that is good. That's for him. a new one. New one. Yeah. Well, congratulations on that. On Nicholas who did that. Nicholas Corona. Well done. That would be a, a highlight of my life if I managed to pull that one off. Uh, all right. If you missed next big category and very relevant to our intro scene. Uh, oh. All right. I just added this in because, fitting as it. you can see, we fitting <laughs> the big spender category. We just have SpaceX repeatedly destroying rockets. Uh, and then I saw that they got the contract to go to the moon. Only 850 million so far to make that happen, which I figure for 850 million, I can get to the moon, but all right, they can have it. 224 seems like a long shot, but we will continue now to use that big spender intro clip until they get to the moon. We are committed mm -hmm. to the moon as much as they are. <laughs> <laughs> Crazy. All right. And then cool. in a more legit, a, a far more legit uh, big spender, we have, uh, we both called on this one. So yep. do you want to introduce S that? Sysdig is a unicorn now. So uh, yeah, big spender. They got, <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's uh, what one of two now security uh, platforms that are unicorns. So they just uh, finished up their Series F funding, 188 million to bring valuation to 1.2 billion. Uh, begs the question of where they're going to go from here. Series mm -hmm. F, I believe, is the last round. So, you know, is acquisition, it? IPO, I believe so. There's no somebody wants to correct me. I mean, I can know. you go to Z? I don't know. Why not, right? But yeah, weird, so thing, two, weird things are happening. So anything's possible. Yeah, two security unicorns. It's. Uh, it's interesting. And it's the total funding for Sysdig is now at 394 and their valuation is 112 billion. So, yeah, that is pretty amazing. Looking at, you know, a third of the cost being in VC funding. Hmm. Well, exciting to see where they go and what they do with all of that uh, yeah. investment. That's Good for cool. Sysdig and uh, shout out to our friends at Falco. Yeah, amazing. All righty. Uh, so, we are next big. We don't have an intro thing for our KubeCon picks. Uh, yeah, I wish. We didn't cobble that together fast enough, but I have picks, you have picks, and our guest is here. Shall we? Shall we? How do we bring her in? Like oh. this. Well, welcome, Liz. Hello. Can you hey, hear me? Welcome. We can <laughs> hear you loud and clear. Amazing. Yeah. Technology. Yeah, that's right. And we're, we've actually done this on time. It is four fifteen. You're here. I, I mean, I shouldn't be amazed by that. We're professionals. Yeah. <laughs> Speak for yourself, Steve. I mean, it's Friday afternoon, but yeah, we're, we're here on time. <laughs> we're, we're, we're doing well. So we were just about to get into our 
what we're excited to see next week for KubeCon, and that shouldn't like take more than five minutes. And then we'd like to talk to you about your new gig at Isovalent and the technologies that surrounds all of that. Is that cool? Sounds good to me. Yep. All right. Shall we? Shall we let you start with the honors? And uh, do you have any KubeCon picks or talks or anything you're doing at KubeCon you want to plug? Uh, yeah, so um, I've just come off our, um, <laughs> this is my second live stream of the day. We, we have yeah. a thing that we've just recently started called Echo, and we pulled together a list of eBPF-related talks that are happening next week at KubeCon. So I've got like half a dozen of those that uh, I haven't heard <laughs> of, um, but I can send you a link to like our show notes, and then you've got all the links to everything that's happening in eBPF. I will say Amazing. one thing that's pretty cool. There is a talk about Tesla using eBPF for security. Oh, that's Ooh. quite a cool, you know, brand to be talking about security. That is, that is awesome. Yeah. And I'm going to be right. popping up on a few different panels and things next week. And I have a keynote that's pre recorded in my role as chair of the TOC, the Technical Oversight Committee. So people will probably be bored of my face and my voice by the end of next week <laughs> <laughs> impossible <laughs> speaking of which we actually okay so that's a, that's I, one of my picks actually was related to you but i'm going to hold off there because i'm really curious to see what michael's got in his locker for kubecon so i put, pulled a couple of picks from the uh, cloud native security day too um and we had been mentioning supply chains and in Toto and Spire. So that was one of the talks that I was really interested in seeing was Cole Kennedy and uh, Mikhail Swift. They're doing securing the supply chain. So thought if people are tuning into the show, that'd be something that they're interested in. And uh, yeah, the other one was Power Level 9000. So Chaos Engineering oh. with uh, Sam. Yeah, that was another one I'm really looking forward to checking out. I had... A, I, my list had another EBPF talk for Cloud Native Security Day, but Liz stole the thunder there. She got the whole list of, of all well, that. Who, I, it, how, how is that not going to happen? Yeah, it's <laughs> yeah. There's, there's a ton. <laughs> Cloud Native Security Day is, is a really good lineup. And uh, I I remember last uh, Cloud Native um, KubeCon, there was a list of like what the top topic was, and security was the top topic. I think EBPF is just the top topic mm. this year. <laughs> so Maybe it is, yeah. The other thing that's really cool at Cloud Native Security Day is they've got a CTF, which will be on live streamed on twitch too yeah <laughs> that's scary okay cool yeah I, I, so then i'll jump in so my i had i have one two, three, i have too many i've got like about 12 picks but a lot fell on the thursday so i'm just going to kind of focus on on that one day because there was a and like if you were getting into kubernetes and security there is like a happy hacking into kubernetes security for beginners which i thought was really cool and then Shortly afterwards, which is a nice valent one, was uncovering a sophisticated Kubernetes attack, which I thought was... That is the Tesla one, I believe. Oh, is it? Yes, yes. It's Isabel ah, and so we... Tesla. Yeah. Ah, so that's... Okay, I didn't get to see where Jed Salazar was from. He's the, yeah. the non isovalent. So that looks... Okay, good. I'm doubling down on that one because that one looked awesome. And then finally, probably the most exciting thing throughout KubeCon is the Star Wars trivia. Because as you can see, I've got a Chewbacca here, so I've got to live up to a certain a certain claim here. Uh, and if I'm not doing well in the Star Wars trivia, something's going, I'm going to turn in my Chewbacca, essentially. That is in the evening on Your Thursday. Your reputation so. is shattered. Yeah, on the line. <laughs> it is on the line. I can't <laughs> not do that. I ha I've, been, I've had this thing behind me for five years. But yeah, so that's, I really like Thursday. I think it's looking really hot. Uh, and well, there, I mean, we could talk about lots of other things, but that seems to me the day that I'm not going to get distracted by my real job. The, the <laughs> other talk that you that you mentioned, the, uh, is it Tavi Sable and Ellen Corbett's? One? Yes, it is. Do you yeah. know a, a, another exciting aspect of that talk? All right. What? Check out the music credit for that, that talk. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> Is it you? That's all I'm saying. <laughs> okay. All right. All right. I'm very excited about that. <laughs> okay. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah, that was uh, bringing security to the 101 track, I believe, right? Yeah. There's, yeah. yeah. Which is That's really awesome. cool. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Really good. <laughs> all right. Awesome. Awesome. Okay. Good. Those are our those are our picks. That's pretty sweet. Now, I guess we'll just jump straight into 
you, Liz. What's <laughs> what's going on? Tell us what's going. You've been at Isovalent for about six weeks, six, five or six, six weeks. Six. I didn't quite count, but yeah, it must be about that. Yeah. Yeah. How's yeah. it? How's it going? Tell us a little bit about it. What you do? What they do? Just give us a. Yeah, know, it's a, it's really okay. fun. I feel like I'm I'm new enough that I don't have like a you know roll off the tongue. I've said eight thousand times what we do. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. So. The folks at Isovalent are the people who invented the Cilium networking project, really expert in eBPF. Cilium has been based on eBPF since the you know, dawn of time. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, using Cilium to do not just networking in Kubernetes, but also observability and security, because eBPF is such a cool, all-seeing, you know, it's a way of seeing everything that's happening in your machine so it's a very very cool platform to build connectivity networking and observability on so that's basically what we do Cilium is an open source project and we also have like enterprise version but I concentrate really on the open source side and the you know talking to people about open source CNCF we've just submitted uh, Cilium that was one of the um exciting things that happened pretty soon after I joined as we, uh, we've, we've submitted Cilium to the, the CNCF as a, um, we're hoping it will be an incubation project that comes to the TOC, which I'm involved in. And obviously I'm kind of like, yeah, I think that would be really good. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I, I wouldn't have joined the company if I didn't have a, a lot of faith in the project. So I think my, you know, how I feel about that project was pretty clear regardless. <laughs> mm. Yeah, no kidding. Yeah, totally. <laughs> Four years at the previous company. That's uh that's a long haul to switch to something like that. So you must have believed in it, right? But, yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, it, it was exactly four years at Aqua. And it, you know, it was a really good time. Um, but I definitely sometimes you just need to you need a change, right? You need to do something different and do something new. And I'd mm-hmm. been pretty excited about EBPF for a while and uh the folks at ISO Valent are really nice people and very smart collecting a lot of really good expertise in one company in particularly around ebpf so uh i figured i can go there and learn a whole ton of new things and that's yeah. working out you're gonna have to educate us i think probably uh after you get more than six weeks into the company because <laughs> finding information on ebpf is tough so that's why i'm looking forward to this kubecon coming up it's um newer technology and looking forward to it yeah yeah well i've done a little bit before um, so I've uh, I think probably a couple of years ago, maybe three or four years. I can't remember how many years ago because time is weird. Um, I did a talk <laughs> about um, eBPF and um, kind of getting started with it, like a beginner's guide to programming in eBPF and just sort of uh, the kind of hello world of getting something to run in the kernel. And uh, that was, you know, I, I knew I was, really just scratching the surface of what you could do with ebpf so uh, i've still got a ton to learn but uh yeah it's i'm, I'm not completely at ground zero at this point <laughs> well there true. might be people watching who are at ground zero actually so can you like quickly summarize like what ebpf is just so that anybody who's watching this and was hoping to get that insight then that yeah. now they know and why they should watch all those talks at kubecon yeah so it stands for um, extended Barclay packet filter. That's almost irrelevant. You know, you, know, you can ignore that. <laughs> um, what it allows you to do is run custom programs within the kernel. So you can write code, attach it to pretty much any event that happens in the kernel, like a function being run in the kernel or a packet arriving on a network or a trace point or any one of many different uh, events, a system call being called from a, uh, an application. And you get to run a piece of custom code whenever that event happens. And uh, so first of all, it's running in the kernel. The kernel has visibility across everything that happens in the machine. And by being in the kernel, BPPF, BPF programs can effectively get visibility into a ton of things that are happening. And then there's a mechanism for letting you 
kind of exchange your shared data between the kernel and user space. So you can write applications that kind of coordinate all these little BPF programs and bring all these, like, uh, you know, what you have observed at these different points within the kernel together into one big view of what's happening. And that's super cool in Kubernetes because you can tie things together like, oh, this network packet arrived and I can see that it's destined for this IP address, but I can also connect that to the pod that's currently associated with that IP address. So you can kind of get visibility of you know, how network traffic relates to all the different components running in, in Kubernetes, which is very cool. That sounds awesome. And so my understanding as well, I mean, because network observability, uh, people have been working on that within Kubernetes through a variety of other different ways, plus runtime visibility, all of this, it kind of has existed. But then eBPF seems to be able to tie all of that together. And there is a performance perk to that as well, is there not? There is indeed, yeah. For example, if you have a network packet that arrives on a network interface and it's going to go through a network stack in the kernel and maybe it's going to have to get like say you've got a service mesh it's going to get rooted up into user space go through another networking stack maybe get redirected to some you know, there's like all these different kernel and user space stacks that it might have to traverse and with eBPF, you can just bypass all these things and kind of cut straight to the chase, go straight from, you know, practically your packet arriving on the wire to the process that's going to handle it. So, yeah, tons of ways of being super efficient. Plus, you know, you're running C code, compiled code that's running in the kernel. So it's super fast. That sounds pretty cool. Uh, well, is there any... Uh, and, and sorry, if I keep, I keep, I have questions in my head, so I keep asking them. So Foster, just interrupt me if, uh, if I'll keep it going. Want to... All right, cool. So, are there? What are we looking forward to from Isovalent in terms of next steps and things we might be excited to see in terms of either Cilium, eBPF, or anything that you've got in in your locker for the uh, for open source offerings that are becoming in the near future? Or can you tell us about that? Is it too early? Yeah, so we're pretty, you know, open what we're doing, uh, certainly with the open source side of things. It's all, you know, developed openly. We have an open governance model. We are on the cusp of releasing the latest version, 1.10. Um, so there's a release candidate of that out today, and that has lots of cool features, many of which I haven't internalized yet, but I know what some of them are. Some of them are, uh, I've got a new... CLI. So uh, some of the things that you want to do, like install Cilium is now as simple as Cilium install you in the right Kubernetes context. We'll just inherit the context and install Cilium for you, which is very nice. Um, and things like uh, being able to uh, install and then run the, uh, we have this thing called Hubble, which is an observability layer um, that sort of optional you know, maybe you don't need it but if you do need it it's um it's there so it's not kind of built in because you might not need it um i could even show you this if this was helpful please <laughs> oh um yeah this if i do this this will be my first uh live demo of cilium so i'm not doing anything that other people haven't done before but uh let's let's see if i can you let me move this screen off here. I think if you share, and we can share. add it, and that'll become the main screen. Okay, let's see. Screen one. I'm going to share that. Mm -hmm. And can you Let me know. Yeah. Yeah. There we go. There it is. Yeah, there we go. All right. Suck so, uh, yeah, this is, this is my... <laughs> Yeah, I, I am using Weave's Sock Shop as a little yeah. demo app because why not? It's got some microservices and, and what have you. Yeah. So um, KS is just my little shortcut for um, Kube Control in the Kube system namespace. So I have some pods running and hopefully, yeah, live demo. Working good. Yeah. So you can see things like a couple of um, Cilium pods. Uh, you can see a thing called the Hubble Relay and the Hubble UI that I'll come to. Um, and I should probably just uh, 
actually I'm on I've got two nodes and um, so that's why I've got two Cilium pods I've got one agent on each uh, on each node and uh, what could I do I could for example uh, let's have a look at some traffic flowing uh, so if I go back a bit I could probably do Hubble observe and see some traffic from the sock shop I should probably also I'll show you in a second uh, let me do this now. Q control, uh, get pods in the namespace of sock shop. So I'm running various pods in there. And we can see some traffic that's gone backwards and forwards that um, Cilium has connected. Well, Cilium is responsible for this networking, but it's uh, you know, also keeping track of what's happened. Uh, and I don't know if you noticed that I, I did filter that on... Uh, the namespace sock shop so I could hmm. also be looking at whatever's happening in the cube system namespace for example because it's got this awareness of what's happening in the Kubernetes level as well as what's happening at the kind of mm. IP and port level and uh, just to do a really quick kind of idea of the kind of things that we can do with network policy um so actually, let me show you the UI. So I've got this UI. I'm just going to refresh it to make sure it's kind of up to date. And that's showing a very similar view to what we just saw in terms of um, packets being routed between different um, components in this namespace. We can see whether they what they're intended for, whether they got forwarded or not. And I've got this, I have actually got a uh, network policy in place and it's not quite right at the moment so if i go to my weave socks ui it doesn't look great there's mm. something missing here <laughs> this, this doesn't look quite right and if i go back to my ui we'll see that when i made that you know refresh the the weave page it was dropping some packets and it's dropping some packets to port 80 and saying it's because there's a policy denied and uh, I'm just going to have a look at the policy. So this one was a Cilium network policy. Oh, it's in Sock Shop, not in the uh, system. Oops, Sock Shop. And so I can describe that policy. You can see the details of it. And there are various ports that it is allowing, but it wasn't allowing uh, port 80. If you remember, it was mm -hmm. port 80 that was blocked. Mm -hmm. So if I were to update my policy, yeah, well, we can see, there it is. Look, somebody, some fool, committed out port 80. That's, that's oh. going to be necessary. So if I apply that... Oops. Sock shop CMP. Okay. So that should have applied the new policy. And now if I go back to uh, the UI, you can see it's already Wait. actually loaded. Yeah. So that worked all right. And we should see now everything's being forwarded, including to port 80 now. So what I'd done was I'd, I'd block traffic between the front end and things like cart and catalog where they, they're expecting traffic on port 80. Right. So it's That's just awesome. a little example of network policy in, in action. And no kidding. And the, the Kubernetes context really helps a lot. I find that's... That's kind of just the big gap, I think, with a lot of security tools and working with Kubernetes, right? Giving exactly. the operators that, that context. Yeah. If you were using something like um, TCP dump to look at traffic, you'd you'd see IP addresses mm. and ports, and that's quite difficult to to map. I mean, we can actually even look at um, if we want to get into some some more details. I can show if we look at one of these Cilium agents, and um, I think if I do something like this um so now i'm inside that agent and if i were to do something like um if i list the endpoints at this level and see uh 
it's, it's a bit sort of spread out on the screen, but there's an identity. This is just a, an internal ID. You can see all the things like the, the labels that are associated with this endpoint and the IP address. Um, these enabled and disabled are about whether policies are applied on, on these endpoints. Mm -hmm. And we can also look at that at a kind of BPF level. Um, BPF, I think it's something like this. And those same IDs, I think we were just looking wow. at 2825. You know, we can see the IP address it's associated with. We can see what we're a uh, bit more information at the at the BPF level there. Um, I'm going to also look at things like services. Um, I think it's service list. Yeah, so we can see how Cilium on this node is sort of relating different IP addresses. Um, oh, that's yeah, so awesome. We'd probably find, you know, if we looked at a Kubernetes service and the pods that backed up that service, you know, the service IP address would be over here and the uh, pod IP addresses would be over this side. Mm -hmm. That's pretty sweet. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. The, All uh, right. <laughs> not bad for the first demo. No issues. The demo gods were no. good. It all worked. Yeah. yeah. It's amazing. Yeah, good. All right. Shall I stop my screen share now? Sure. Unless yeah, we can, you, we unless can you take want you out of here. Okay. Unless you want to ask me to try and do something that goes wrong. Something more, more advanced. I have a question. So there, the Salem network policies that you had, there was a, I think we had it, we did it on the show. I can't remember how many weeks ago there was an isovalent kind of you could generate Cilium policies on the fly with a kind of a UI, which was pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. There's a um, network policy editor. So we actually have a site called networkpolicy.io that we've built for kind of talking about network policy. Uh, it links you to the um, that editor that you're talking about, which is pretty cool. You can kind of view. Uh, it's a, it looks a little bit like that service map representation, but you can see how ingress and egress traffic will be affected by a particular policy. And it kind of, you can say, oh, no, actually, I want to allow, should, should we look at it? Should we, should we bring it up? Do you, do you have, do I have, I'm just, I've just tricked you into another demo. Yeah, I? I know. I, I, can, yeah, good like that. I can do that. Um, <laughs> well, I think not? the objective I was looking for was that when people are thinking about Cilium network policies and then they're thinking, but I already know Kubernetes network policies. So what are the, why, what am I getting? What's on top of using Cilium? What are the bonus features of using Cilium network policies outside of just observability that yeah. I can do with Cilium? I couldn't do with Kubernetes because I'm pretty sure when I started playing with it, I was able to create policies I could do with Cilium and then when I flipped over to Kubernetes, it went, no, you can't do this. Here. Yeah, so there are a few things that you can let me see if I can share. Can you see that editor? So this is the, the editor that we were talking about. Um, and yeah, there, there are kind of Kubernetes network policies and Cilium network policies. Um, I'm not sure if I'm going to be 100% uh, correct on everything here but some of the differences are you can have in a cilium network policy you can um define domain names like fully qualified domain names that you can mm -hmm. allow traffic to so in a kubernetes policy you might say you know allow egress traffic to 1.2.3.4 with the cilium network policy you can say allow network traffic to google.com or whatever mm. domain name you want to um, relate to. I'm sure there are some other things that are um, specific to Cilium policies, but I am failing to remember them right now. I'm sure if uh, <laughs> maybe somebody else on, on the stream can put in the comments, mm -hmm. and remind me what I'm missing. Um, but yeah, there are a few. Um, see if there's anything in here. Yeah, oh, of can... course, the other thing that's, the, yeah, the big thing, the big thing is um, <laughs> layer seven policy. So you can do things like have policies around, um, you know, you're allowed to do posts, but only to this path and you know, like ah. HTTP posts to this path or gets to that path uh, on that particular, uh, you know, pod or service or, or IP address. Yeah, that's perfect. And all through this UI as well, which is great. Yeah. So you can kind of, you can see how different, um, Check, you know, if I were to add a different pod in here. Um, 
think that will I, add I know it. some of my biggest headaches are working with network policies in YAML files. So this is uh, <laughs> it's yeah. awesome to work through a UI like this. And it will tell you that things like, um, so if I, if I delete this, this is a classic thing for people to get wrong with network policy that you know, my, my pod might be allowed to generate traffic to another service, but if it isn't also allowed to do DNS traffic, it can't find out where that service is. Mm -hmm. So th this is like a kind of handy thing to add in the policy. And it, you can have the same thing in, in Kubernetes as well. Um, it's a um, thing that you, you know, regardless of what kind of network policy you're using, this is, this is something you could easily miss and, and it would, uh, cause problems sweet excellent and do you want to take your screen down and then we can ask you for another demo right after this again yeah why uh, not let's do that yeah, do a thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. cool, cool. What, what should i open next <laughs> well actually so do you have a i'm not gonna ask for a demo i was gonna do the thing that you wanted to do uh michael which was call her up on some of the predictions from last yeah because all you do yeah, I wanted to yeah, yeah. kind of make it light to finish up and, you know, saw your your TOC chair predictions. Now, these are the chair predictions, not just yours, right, obviously. But... Uh, yeah, the TOC. The, the yeah, the TOC, TOC. kind of helped um, with uh, thinking of them. Yeah. Are, you, are you bringing it up, Steve? We took screenshots. Uh, I'm not sure if I, you wanted I to. I apologize, Liz, in advance for the screenshots. I did them on my phone, and I did not vet the facial expressions oh god <laughs> that that happened to be there that oh, is chaos no. engineering right there <laughs> yeah yeah uh but yeah um, so there was the you know, chaos engineering web assembly and ebpf ebpf yeah. definitely spot on with that one uh service mesh kubernetes on the edge and chaos engineering uh now you said you're doing another toc chair conversation is it somewhat like the one at last yeah. So one of the things, it, it's slightly different. Um, one of the things that I'm doing in that keynote is revisiting those predictions and seeing oh, cool. how, how they're panning Ooh. out, in particular how it's panning out in the sandbox. So, um, you know, the CNCF has these different maturity levels for projects and the sandbox is supposed to be, you know, experimentation. And uh, we thought, well, if these predicted areas are genuinely going to be, you know, hot areas and places where people are innovating then we should be seeing sandbox projects in those areas and we are um and i had to record the keynote i don't know three or four weeks ago and since we did that we've had a few more applications from projects that i think even more emphasize that those areas that we pulled out are, are pretty I mean, you know, you can't really tell how much that's self-fulfilling. Like just mm -hmm. because, you know, <laughs> when we said WebAssembly, did that make a whole load of projects go, ah, you know, we should Ooh. submit to the CNCF. <laughs> yeah, but uh, um, yeah, it, it, it seems like it's on a good track. And, and in particular, uh, developer and operator experience is one of the areas that we have called out as like, you know, mm. these need to improve. They, they need to be, it needs to be easier to, write and operate applications to, to run in cloud native ways. And we're definitely seeing a lot of innovation in that whole, whole area. Awesome. I was going to say, if you wanted to give a couple more predictions, but it seems like people I need to tune in next week for that. You have to, yeah, exactly. You have to watch yeah. the keynote. Yeah. <laughs> there are a couple of other, well, yeah, any, any one so personal prediction, prediction that, that, that to... yeah, any one personal area that never got called out on the, uh, stream that you can kind of say, hey, I'm interested in this space. You can be as vague as you want. Uh -oh, I can't think of anything. No. I'm so, you know, preoccupied with like EBPF being exciting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, like, that's putting put you on the spot. It, that's fair. Mm -hmm. There's a lot in flight. And then, hey, we'll have to take some bad screenshots uh, next week and we'll, we'll come back to you. Uh, Thanks for that. Yeah. 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 In, in six months and see what those predictions because i mean i will be honest those predictions are pretty spot on <laughs> thank you <laughs> i mean it's you know we're in a very privileged position in the toc to kind of see lots of things that are happening and um you know have conversations with lots of interesting people so it it you know it that's kind of how we get that perspective on what we think is coming down the road mm -hmm. 
Um, so uh, yeah, you get all that community feedback, right? Like as, uh, as all those yeah. chairs. Yeah, and you know, you 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 can see that if there are lots of projects in a particular area or lots of excitement about projects in a particular area, that must you know indicate some something. Yeah, you know, mm -hmm. whether it's exciting technology or exciting um, spaces that need to be you know solved or mm -hmm. maybe money you know this is another thing that seems to drive <laughs> yeah. drive, mm. drive excitement so. mm -hmm. cool, cool okay uh should we wrap up because this is we've been 45 minutes this has gone timing wise this has gone very well and uh, i think liz thank you very much for sparing time in your i imagine incredibly busy day as kubecon's approaching next week you've only been there six weeks i imagine it's hectic to say the least so thank you very much for being on the oh, show thank you and thank you. you you were my first you know live demo as i say so it was uh, great to have that opportunity to uh, to try forgiving, that out. Yeah. a forgiving and small audience <laughs> <laughs> i could i could say something like you know well maybe one of those is true but i don't know about the other <laughs> <laughs> mm. <sighs> cheeky yeah yeah awesome no, Thank okay. you very much for uh, having me. We'll let you go and we will wrap up the show. Thank you very much. All right. So, take, take care. care. See you, Liz. All right. Awesome. That was good. Great, great finish. Great demo. Got some insight into Cilium eBPF. Got some impromptu demos that she wasn't planning to do. Yes. Yeah, that's awesome. Thanks so much for that. Yeah. Yeah, that was pretty cool. Okay, that was a great show. And thanks everybody for watching. We had, I think we had quite a few viewers at our, at our peak. Yep. So if you're watching now or you're watching in the future on YouTube, all right, I hope you uh, enjoyed like, the show. Subscribe, yeah, come and check us out every week, 12 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. GMT. You know what to do. Uh, all right, uh, and we'll sign off. My name's Steve Jaguar. And I'm Mike Foster. Catch you next time. Yes.